The following worship service was delivered on July 4, 2021. The communion segment is delivered by Jeff Horst, sermon segment by Michael Jones, and song service by Brandon Sanchez. During the communion segment, we take a look at the compassion of Christ and how the scriptures show that Jesus responded to the needs of those around him. In our lives, every Christian experienced the compassion of Christ when Jesus died for them in order that they might be saved. In John 8, Jesus said that if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Today's message is given on the 4th of July, so the theme of the sermon is freedom. Real freedom. There is a greater freedom than that of political freedom, and today's message takes a look at what that freedom means freedom from guilt, freedom from the eternal consequences of sin, and freedom to be blameless before God. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art. My soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. So we're off to a brand new week of serving God and seeing the Lord work in our life. And it's so great for you all to be here with us today as we do that. Um, I wanted to let you know if you're visiting with us today, we'd sure appreciate it if you'd let us know. If you'd text uh, Orange View to that number on the screen, 94000. What that'll do is it'll bounce back to you some information about the congregation and enable us to get whatever information you're comfortable to share with us. Um, about your visit here today. So a name and address and stuff like that would be terrific, not because we're going to show up unexpectedly at your home, but because we'd like to send you a note or card and thanking you for coming out to be with us today. Also, if you need a copy of our bulletin, that's attainable also through the same process. Just uh, text OV Weekly to that same number, and it will spit right back to you a copy of the bulletin, and you'll be all good to go. Now, I do have some of those in print form, so if you're a technophobe and you don't want to do any of that stuff, that's fine. During the break, you can come up and see me. I'll give you a print copy of that, and that would be just terrific. Also, I wanted to let you know that uh, you should have received a communion kit on your way in this morning. So we don't pass communion trays or any giving trays or anything like that. So you should have got one of these when you came in. It will either be that form or it will be that form. If you need to get one of these, you will need it for the communion service. You can excuse yourself to the back of the auditorium where we have plenty of both of those for you. And you'll be all set to go when the communion time comes around. Also, I wanted to give you an opportunity to let us know about whatever's going on in your life that you'd like to share with us. And you can do that by filling out a communication card. That's also done online. So if you just go to the church's webpage at followthebible.com, click that little button at the top that says visitor or communication card, and then fill that guy out. That'd be terrific. On that form, there's a specific spot for prayer requests. So if you have a prayer need of any kind, please use that system to get that to us. What we'll do is we'll take that prayer need 
We will echo it out to the congregation so we can get a lot of prayer activity going for you. So remember, James reminds us that the prayers of a righteous man avail much. So there is nothing better for you to do with anything that's going on in your life that you need some help with than to ask for prayers on that. So we would certainly appreciate you allowing us to do that so that we can watch God work in your life as well. Um, so uh, we had a prayer need that came in just a little while ago, actually, from a uh, member here who's got a son, I believe is correct, in Washington State with a fairly newborn infant, I think that's correct, and they have COVID going in in their household right now. So we'd sure appreciate your prayers on that, um, and we're confident that we'll see the Lord work there too. But Steve Woodside's going to leave us in our opening prayer, and so we'll hand the mic over to him, and then we'll be off and running. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you today. Be with us through this worship. Thank you for sending your son that we might have a home in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy. You joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies to his beloved Son, strong in the Lord of us, and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trusts, who in the strength of Jesus trust his more than conquer that having all things done and all your conflicts past you may or come through Christ alone you may all come through Christ alone and stand in time at last in heavenly armor will enter
to the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapons that fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When your power oppresses and heart, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. They tried my Lord and Master with no one to defend within the halls a pilot he stood without a friend i'll be a friend to jesus my life for him i'll spend i'll be a friend to Jesus until my year shall hand to all who need a Savior, my friend I recommend because he brought salvation is why I am his friend. I'll be a friend to Jesus, my life for him. I'll spend, I'll be a friend to Jesus until my years shall end. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, the gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was glorified. Your every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live.
Good morning. This morning in preparation for the Lord's Supper, I want to take just a few minutes and take a closer look at the compassionate heart that Jesus had and the love that Jesus demonstrated for others because of that compassion that he had and also the results of his following through on that compassion. And I want to do that this morning by going through some scriptures uh, in the New Testament that, that demonstrate that compassionate heart that Jesus had. So let's start uh, first in Luke chapter 7 uh, and read there, starting in verse 11. We can see here that Jesus went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now as he approached to the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her. And he said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. So this first passage is a perfect example of how Jesus was able to relate to people, even, even strangers that he had never met before, and how he could feel for them, he could feel with them as they experienced sadness uh, over events, various events that may, may happen in their lives. And in this particular instance, it says the widow was weeping over the death of her only son, yet Jesus touched his coffin and raised the man from death to life. And in so doing that, Jesus enabled this woman to have her son back. What a, what a compassionate, compassionate thing that was. What a loving heart Jesus showed to be able to do that for this widow. And for us, Jesus showed us that he wasn't afraid to take action. Second passage in Matthew chapter 9, we can read another example of Jesus's heart here, starting in verse 35. It says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and, proclaim, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. So this passage shows us Jesus was out and about traveling city to city, and he was doing a number of things. Um, some miraculous healing was shown uh, in this case uh, with those that he came in contact with who had sickness or disease in their life. Uh, and, and, and Jesus stepped up. Jesus took action. He did something about it. Verse 36 says, Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dis dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus took it upon himself to become that shepherd for those people, and he did this through his compassionate heart. Now if we keep looking in Matthew, this time in chapter 14, here we can see two examples where Jesus was compassionate. So let's read here, uh, this is the passage about the feeding of the 5,000, starting in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 14. Now when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them, and he healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate, and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away, that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food. And breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up what was left over the broken pieces, 12 full, full baskets. There were about 5,000 men who ate besides women and children that day. So here's a great example, two examples actually in this, in this passage that I just read, where 
Jesus saw a large crowd, and it says he felt compassion for them, and he healed their sick on the spot. He took action, and that, that's what really strikes my heart. He didn't just sit back, feel that compassion, and do nothing. He healed their sick. And then later on in that passage, he demonstrates again his compassion by seeing that that crowd that was there, that huge crowd, they were hungry, and they were far away from anywhere where they could get food. So he took it upon himself, and he fed them. In this instance, his action was miraculous, and it turned five loaves and two fish into a meal that fed more than 5,000 people that day, again, because of his compassionate heart. Now, if we go over to Matthew 20, verse 29, uh, we can read that as they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him, and two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. So moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. Another great example where Jesus saw, he felt that compassion and he took action. He healed the blind men of their affliction. And then the last example I want us to uh, look at this morning before we partake of the Lord's Supper is in John chapter 11. And many of you, I'm sure, are very uh, familiar with this account where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Starting in verse 32. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you, have been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And verse 35 says, Jesus wept. Then starting, skipping down to verse 38, so Jesus again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. So this last account again shows Jesus being moved, his heart being touched by those around him who were weeping and crying. And it moved Jesus to tears as well. And it says that he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled such that it spurred him to take action. He then proceeded to bring Lazarus back from the dead. And in doing so, he eased all around him, all their heavy hearts after that uh, death of Lazarus. So again, five examples this morning that we can look at of how compassionate Jesus was what a wonderful, compassionate shepherd Jesus was for us and is for us. We need to, pass, uh, to pattern ourselves after Jesus, and as he did, when we see things in the world, uh, we need to feel that compassion, uh, and we need to take action when we can and do something about it to try and help those who are suffering. And we use Jesus as our example to do that. Truly, he was a compassionate Savior. So now let's celebrate and remember Christ as we partake of the emblem set before us. So if you'll take out your bread at this time, I'll lead us in a prayer for that bread. Shall we bow? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Son, our Savior Jesus, and his 
his life, his example for us, and for his huge heart, Father, for his compassion that he showed while he was here on this earth for others, and for his willingness to always do for others. We know, Father, that he allowed his body to be broken for us, a sinful man, and we thank you for that sacrifice that he made and his willingness to make that sacrifice, and we thank Jesus at this time. Uh, we pray that this emblem that we're partaking will bring to remembrance our, in our minds his broken body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you'll take out your cup, I'll offer, an, I'll offer a prayer for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to reflect and to remember Jesus and his sacrifice. And again, we just offer thanks for his willingness to die for us that through his death and through that covenant we could have forgiveness of sins. We pray your blessings on this cup at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And that concludes the Lord's Supper. Well, we've come to the point of our service where in just a moment we're going to have a brief break. We'll have a five-minute timer that will count down for us. So part of the uh, purpose of that, bre that break is to enable those of us who are members here to meet and greet our visitors. So if you're a visitor here with us today, don't be surprised if we wander over and say hello and thank you for coming out and being with us again. And don't forget again, if you are visiting with us, if you'd text Orange View to that number there on the screen, 94,000. Uh, we'll bounce back some information to you, and you'll be all set to go. Now, also during this time, I do a couple other things, too. So one thing that I do is for you guys out there who are technophobes and don't want technical emails and text messages and stuff, but do want a bulletin, I have print bulletins here in the front. So you can come on up and retrieve one of those for me, and that would be just fine. And then also during this period of time, I distribute out what I call a kid's meal. It's not really a meal. It's a kid's activity packet that's designed to teach the sermon material to the younger element of the congregation or adults that learn better that way, I suppose. Um, so it's got crossword puzzles and word finds and coloring and things like that. And uh, for you younger guys, if you want to come up and grab one of those during the break and then bring it to me out at the visitor table when we're all done here this morning, I'll give you a prize and you'll be all happy to go. Um, also, so uh, one other thing I wanted to tell you as well is just today is the 4th of July. You guys all knew that, I'm sure. And uh, I do have a, an event at my house scheduled for tonight. Um, so at 5.30, 6.30, something like that, we're going to get together and have a congregational event. You're all welcome to come over to my place and uh, we'll eat hot dogs and blow stuff up. It'll be wonderful. So we'd love to have you there. But I'll go ahead and uh, start our timer now, and we'll see you all back here in five minutes. Thanks a bunch. If you need a bulletin or a kid pack, come get me. Let us adore the ever-living God and render praise unto him who spread out the heavens and established the earth and whose glory is manifest throughout all the earth he is our god he is our God, there is no one else. He is our God, He is our God, there is no one else. I praise your name. Most high and awesome God, and lift my hands unto you. You saved my soul on the rugged tree. 
Now I praise you and serve you, Lord, throughout eternity. You are my God. You are my God. There is no one else. You are my God. You are my God. There is no one else. There is Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free from the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, place, spirit, place, set our hearts on fire, flow, With grace and mercy, send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence, from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Place, Spirit, place. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Hey, so as we spend time in the scriptures this morning, I want to invite you to turn over to John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Jesus makes a statement about freedom that's most appropriate for us today. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son remains forever. So, if the son sets you free, then you will be free indeed. So today, of course, being the 4th of July, we celebrate our nation's uh, birthday. Our nation is 245 years old. So about two and a half centuries ago, we had a group of people who determined to establish our country. The nation was born. Um, built into our nation is an assumption of godliness for sure, and um, a lot of that has kind of permeated even our founding documents. You know, like we hold these truths to be self-evident and, and such. And so as we come today on the 4th of July, we're reminded of that. But do keep in mind that freedom, even though it uses the word free, is not in fact free. Uh, it was very costly. So we stand here today, 245 years after the founding of our nation, the beneficiaries of costs paid by a lot of other people before us. 
One of the more famous quotes of the founding fathers was Thomas Jefferson's quote that the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. And that was certainly true for the revolutionaries who began our nation. But I'll tell you that my favorite founding father quote is actually not from Thomas Jefferson. It is from Benjamin Franklin who said this, Man will ultimately be governed by God or by tyrants. That's a very insightful observation. Essentially what he says is we will either have a godly nation or we will be ruled by evil men. Jesus spoke about freedom. And he said if you want real freedom, that freedom is found in Christ. If the Son sets you free, then you're free indeed. But the freedom that he speaks of there, of course, is not political freedom. It's freedom from sin. Whoever practices sin is a slave to sin. So if you want to have real freedom, you get that through Christ. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 8. The law of the Spirit of Christ has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So here we are. Today is actually the 4th of July, the time that we were set free from um, other uh, nations and we became an independent nation in and of ourselves. But as we celebrate that, from a political standpoint, the real freedom that we should celebrate is our freedom that comes in Christ. Because that one has enduring reality. Political freedom will come and go. Nations come and go. But we have the ability to live forever through forgiveness of sin in Christ. So what I want to talk about this morning as we uh, kind of focus our thoughts for the week ahead is to consider some of the things that we have in freedom from the Lord and see where this gets us in a spirit of appreciation. So the first thing I'd like to suggest is one of the freedoms that we enjoy in Christ is freedom from guilt, freedom from our past. You know, the Scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57, now a strangle victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, and death, are gone because of the gift of our Master, Jesus Christ. So thank God for that. Our forgiveness of sin enables us to get past some of the stuff that's happened to us in our past that might actually haunt us. You know, there are plenty of decisions that people make that they carry throughout their life that just haunt them. And we need to let that stuff go, especially those things that God has forgiven us from so that we can move on to, to be more beneficial and productive and useful and fruitful for the Lord. We have that forgiveness because of Christ, right? So Ephesians 1, 7 reminds us that we've been forgiven and we've been had our freedom purchased by the blood of Christ. So because our sins have been forgiven and God has forgiven us of those mistakes of the past, just let them go. You know, I'll tell you, if you go into the, the New Testament and you look in the book of Acts, you can see in Acts chapter 7, the first Christian martyr recorded for us. It's a man by the name of Stephen. And in Acts chapter 7, it concludes by saying that they cast him, that Stephen, out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he cried out and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell down on his knees and said, don't hold this against us. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Now sleep there is a poetic term that's used to refer to the righteous dead. He died. He's the first Christian martyr. And you'll notice the text makes reference to the young man named Saul. Well, chapter 8 starts off telling us a little bit more about this guy. Saul approved of his execution. And there arose that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were scattered everywhere. That became known as the dispersion. And devout men uh, buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. But Saul ravaged the church and entered house after house and dragged off men and women and committed them all to prison. And what you see there is the beginning of Christian persecution that has remained for 2,000 years. That guy who started it was Saul. He later changed his name to Paul. Most of us know him as the Apostle Paul. Now you'd think that would give him grounds to really look back and be full of regret. And surely it would. But Paul moved past that regret. In a book that was written, a biography on the Apostle Paul, uh, writer Chuck Smidall said this. He said, even though your past is soiled, anyone can find a new beginning with God. Don't get stuck on where you are. 
Don't waste your time focusing on what used to be. Remember the hope that we have in Christ calls us to a brighter tomorrow. The sins are forgiven. The shame is canceled out. We are no longer chained to a deep, dark pit of the past. Grace gives us wings to soar beyond it. Move beyond it. If you've got stuff in your past that's been disastrous, things that haunt you that have been troublesome, bad mistakes you've made in the past, even a history of destruction that has ruined all kinds of things in your past, let it go. Christ has forgiven you for it. God has forgiven you for it. You have forgiveness in Christ. Move a young. Another benefit that we receive from our freedom in the Lord is we receive freedom from consequence. So when we look to the scriptures, we can see that the forgiveness of sin includes a lot of benefits. For example, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 7, it tells us that man is appointed to die once. And then after this comes the judgment. Well, the judgment is something that we will all experience. And as we all experience judgment together with the Lord, one of the things that that's going to create for us is the time when we stand before God to give an account for our deeds of the flesh. What do we do? Well, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that means that when the time comes that we stand in judgment before God, we can stand there forgiven. We can stand there forgiven because of the acts of Christ 2,000 years ago who died that we might be free. Free from the penalty of sin. In the crucifixion account in John chapter 19, it tells us that when Jesus was at the end of the event on the cross, his final words were to say, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his life and he died. And that expression, it is finished, refers to Really a commercial transaction that says the debt is paid, a receipt is given. It's done. Allow that to give you peace in knowing that you, when you stand in judgment before God and that day will come, that your past and your sin has been forgiven. The eternal consequences and the sting of death is gone. Now there may still be other consequences. Because what we're speaking about, when we speak about the freedom of consequence, we're being freed from the spiritual consequences of our sin, but there may still be other consequences. Some of those decisions that we make may, in fact, cause a lot of hurt, and those consequences may continue echoing throughout our life. When I was in Georgia, we had a, a person who um, had, was involved in a DUI. She ran over a bicycler and nearly killed him. He spent like six months in the hospital, and she went to prison. After her event where she hit the guy in her GUI and before she went to prison, she obeyed the gospel and became a child of God. And what that means is that her sin was forgiven. But there were still consequences to pay for that, which went on. But those consequences are temporal. They're temporary. They pass. If you step off into eternity guilty of sin, that won't pass. That is forever. But thankfully... Because of our freedom in Christ, we have freedom from the consequences of sin. And here's a really good one, too. We have freedom from accusations of the enemy. And who is that? Well, Colossians 1 tells us this. You were once alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of evil behavior. But now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish, and free from accusation. Now, being free from accusation requires a cost, because the next verse goes on to say, if indeed you continue in the faith. But we have freedom from accusation that's made available to us because of our position in Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Because here's the problem. We have an, a spiritual enemy, the devil, who's referred to in Scripture as being the accuser. When you go to passages in Scripture like Job 1, you see an image of Satan standing before God casting accusations on Job. In the book of Revelation, we see Satan referred to as the accuser of the brethren. 
But we have freedom from that because we enjoy forgiveness in Christ. Jude 24 says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. We have the ability to be presented blameless before God because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Remember, you were once alienated from God because of your evil behavior. But now you've been reconciled in three magic words. Now we have the ability to be presented holy in His sight, without blemish, free from accusation. We are holy and blameless before God, which is a rather remarkable thing but the purpose of God. So Ephesians starts off and says, hey, he chose us before the foundation of the world for a purpose, and that is that we would be holy and blameless before him. And we can do that because Christ is, in fact, holy and blameless. We've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb without blemish or spot. So Romans says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. And that must be really frustrating for the accuser. In Roman or Revelation 12, we see that image of heaven. Where I heard a loud voice come out of heaven that said, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ have come. For the accusers of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. Well, we have real freedom in Christ. We have freedom from guilt. We have freedom from the eternal consequences of a sinful life through forgiveness in Christ. We have freedom from accusation from the devil. And all of these things are true because of what Christ has done for us. When we obey the gospel and become a new child of God, the scriptures tell us that old things are passed away and all things become new. Now, for some of you here, you may need to just let that past go. And for some of you here, you need to take encouragement in knowing that you can stand before God blameless because of what Christ has done for you. And for all of us, that means we should be very appreciative of what the Lord has done. Okay, let's all pray together. Lord, we thank you for our time here together in the Scripture and the opportunity that that's given to us to reflect on our freedom that we enjoy in Christ, our freedom from the law our freedom from the consequences of sin once we obey the gospel and become a child of God, our ability to be free from the past and mistakes that we've blown in the past, our ability to really start over together with you. You know, the scriptures tell us that when we are baptized that we're raised to walk in a newness of life. And so we thank you for that and the reality of knowing that you love us and you care for us and that you'll always be with us and that there's no need for us to ever face anything in life alone. We thank you for all of the blessings that we receive in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that as we go through this week that's ahead of us, that we would remember that that great blessing of all, which is the forgiveness of our sins and the ability to stand righteous before you. We thank you for all of your love and care. We pray you'd continue to be with us always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, Brandon, you want to release another song? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand 
heart shouting victory. The songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Well, we have one more act of worship that we're able to engage in before we conclude our time together here, and that is the act of giving. So the scriptures tell us that God loves a cheerful giver, and we certainly have the opportunity to respond to God's blessings in our life by, re by giving back to the Lord. So we don't pass any kind of uh, collection tray or things like that. We have a couple of ways that we can go about doing our giving. So one is that we can text to uh, text the word GIVE to that number on the screen, 714-450-7010. And then what that will do is it will come back with instructions about how it is that you can go about giving um, electronically. Another thing you can do is go to the congregation's webpage at followthebible.com. And there, just scroll down to the bottom of that first page, and there's a big green button that says Online Giving. Again, just click that button right there, and it will, it will give you back the instructions and the opportunity on how to do that. If you would like to give tangibly, we have the opportunity to do that here today, too. All of the exits from the auditorium have a little collection box there next to it that says Contributions, and you're able to put your gift in for that. do want to, again, remind you that if you are visiting with us today, please text Orange View to that number on the screen, 94000. And what that will do is it will enable you to share with us whatever you would like to share with us that you're comfortable giving as far as your name and contact information so we can say hello and thank you for being with us today. Also want to tell you that when we're all done here in the auditorium this morning that I do migrate out to the porch area where we have a little visitor table set up and I distribute gifts to our visitors. So we'd like to give you a gift for coming to be with us today. There's no cost, no obligation. It's just our chance to be hospitable and cordial. So please drop by and receive that from us. I'm going to go ahead and close us all up in a word of prayer. And then after that, we'll be launched for the rest of the week ahead. I hope you enjoy walking with the Lord. I'm confident that you will see Him working in your life. Please remain diligent in your prayer life. Watch God work. It'll be exciting for you, I promise. All right, let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for our time that we have to be together here as a congregation. Today is a little bit of a special day in the day of our country because it's our Independence Day, the 4th of July. That's a day that a lot of us celebrate our political freedom. But what's really, really important to us, again, though, is the freedom that we enjoy in Christ. The freedom to be free from sin and the consequences of that. And all of that's possible through the gift of Christ who came and died on our behalf. So thank you so much for that. We pray, Lord, as we go away from here today, that we would take the opportunities as they present themselves in order to be light in the world, to be salt of the earth, to, to fill our role of, of guiding other people to you as best that we can. We pray that we would look actively for opportunities to do good to other people, that the love of Christ might be shown to the world that's around us. We thank you for all your love and care, and pray you'd be with us always. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you so much.